Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully we're started now and hopefully we're live. Welcome back to these School History Project SHP Understanding Sessions uh, webinar series Framing US History, the stories your textbook didn't tell you. Uh, once again, my name's Alex Ford. Um, I met you uh, in the last uh, seminar series. We're hopefully going to be joined again today by Leandra Neffin, but we're having a few technical difficulties at this end. So we're just going to see what happens there. Uh, and if Leandra can make it, fantastic. Uh, and if she can't, I'm going to apologise now, uh, both to you and to her, uh, of course, and and uh, she will definitely be with us for the third session coming up as well. So uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction to where we're going with this. Uh, for those of you who missed the first session, um, you can still go back and catch up on that. There's some YouTube links I've sent out to you already. Um, but actually, some of the things that are in the first session will set up today, but also you can see today in its own right as well. So last time we met, we were talking a lot about the traditional narratives of uh, US history, North American history, uh, and the ways in which they tended to sideline or ignore uh, Native American presence, both in the past and continued presence uh, in the United States as well. And one of the things we want to do with today's session uh, is to think about that idea of persistence. Uh, and I've uh, I flagged this book up last time, but I'm going to do it again here. Uh, Nick Est's uh, uh, Our History is the Future is a fantastic book because it begins with uh, the Lakota and Dakota present uh, and thinks about how history has led us to this point. So one of the things we want to challenge today is that traditional narrative, which said basically that uh, the, the story of North America and westward expansion and all of those things was kind of done and over by 1890, that the frontier closed, that there was the massacre at Wounded Knee, the horrific massacre at Wounded Knee, uh, and that that was kind of the end of the story, that the Native American resistance collapsed, that maybe Native American peoples uh, disappeared or were minimized to a point where they, they were disappearing. Uh, and that Manifest Destiny was kind of complete, um, either in a positive way, as, as many traditional historians put it, um, which of course we don't agree with, um, or in a, in a horrific um, completion of a genocide, as uh, lots of revisionist historians would put it. Uh, so that traditional narrative we said was problematic because it ignores continued existence, continued presence, and therefore doesn't really help us understand the issues that exist in the US today. Um, so the story does need reframing. Uh, and what we're going to do today is start to look at some of the stories of people whose lives spanned that period of 1890. So really looking from sort of 1870 to 1880 uh, across that um, point at which, you know, traditional histories would say the frontier of westward expansion closed. Uh, and what happened to these Native Americans who were supposedly annihilated, removed and destroyed um, uh, at that point? And I want to do that with a very particular focus today. Um, so we are thinking about resisting and surviving uh, settler colonialism. Uh, and I said last time, one of the big things we wanted to do was make sure we weren't generalizing too broadly when we talked about Native American peoples, and we talked about the huge diversity of Native American presence in uh, the land now occupied by the United States. Uh, so I want to focus today on one particular group, the Ocheti Shakaway. And we're going to think about how they resisted and survived settler colonialism between 1880 and about 1940. Uh, and the image you can see in the background here is one which actually you might um, have come across in some of your textbooks already, um, which is a, an, an image of a boarding school. Uh, and of course, boarding schools have been in the news a lot recently. Uh, and one of the aims of boarding schools was to uh, assimilate and remove Native American cultures, uh, plural, uh, for the people who went there. So we're going to think about how did people resist and survive that attempt at uh, removal. Before we do that, I think it's worth talking briefly about who the Ocheti Shakaway are. Um, you will probably know them already, as, as it says up here, the Lakota and Dakota peoples, um, and they are a, a really diverse group. You can see on the map here, um, and hopefully my cursor comes up, uh, all of this area in this kind of pale white shading are areas where the Lakota and Dakota, the Ocheti Shakaway, traditionally um, pre-conquest uh, uh, would have been found. So a really huge area, you can see it's over the size of a lot of the states in here, it's the size of uh, most or a good deal of European countries, I would imagine. Um, and you can also see that the pale sort of pink areas that are the red um, underneath uh, are the areas where uh, the Ocheti Shakaway now have reservations uh, and reserved lands. So I think it's worth understanding that, that this is a group of people who existed across a really wide range uh, of lands uh, and, and areas right from you know, the, the Missouri River right across uh, in deep into the Plains region, um, but also are made up of a number of Oyate, 
uh, or peoples. And you can see here seven divisions and the Ocheti Shakawe literally means the seven council fires. Um, and underneath those as well, um, a, 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 a range of tiosopei uh, or, or kind of bands, uh, if you want. So the Ocheti Shakaway uh, are, are going to be our focus. It's also worth, I think, remembering that they still exist, of course, uh, and the Ocheti Shakaway are still um, a, a people and they still exist in a variety of um, walks of life, on reservation, off the reservation, in the US, outside the US, uh, and, and in a whole range of places as well. And I just wanted to put up some, some people um, who would say they, they are uh, part of the Ocheti Shakaway from uh, professors of history like Jimmy Sweet, whose work I think you read for me before this session, uh, right the way through to writers and poets, chefs, actress, actors and actresses, um, runners, rap artists and so on. So um, that was the first thing. So uh, dealing with who the Ocheti Shakaway are, the second thing I wanted to talk about was going back to this issue of settler colonialism. So our question is, how did the Ocheti Shakaway survive uh, and resist settler colonialism, I think it's worth reminding ourselves what settler colonialism is all about. Uh, and we talked again about this briefly last time and said that um, in settler colonialism, the the concept is that a, a conquering nation goes into a, a land that they don't have uh, claim to or right to, uh, and they don't just colonize it as in try and take it over, but they take it over and then remove the people who are already there. Um, usually by force, but by a whole range of means as well. Uh, and so lots of historians now would argue that the US attempted to enact a, a settler colonial um, conquest uh, of the land that the US now occupies and that they were relatively successful in doing so uh, because of the way we are now. Um, although if you've, uh, it's really interesting today, we've just looked at um, the Secretary of State for the Interior, Deb Haaland, um, who is Native American as well, um, talking about uh, the ways in which the US now needs to start to come to terms with some of this settler colonial past. Um, and if you go and look up Deb Haaland today on the news, you'll find some references to an investigation into boarding schools, which we will also look at today as well. So uh, there's a whole range of historians who argue that the US has attempted to enact a uh, settler colonialism via multiple means. Uh, there are four means here which Jeffrey Osler um, identifies. First, uh, the attempt to await what, what um, lots of Europeans thought would happen, which was natural extinction. I'm using that inverted commas. So this idea that um, indigenous peoples would die away because they were somehow less modern than the peoples who were coming in. Um, and of course, that, that just wasn't going to happen. Um, Although, of course, disease had an enormous impact on uh, indigenous populations, and we still don't know quite the scope of that, but we know that it was millions and millions of people who died from uh, European diseases. Uh, secondly, uh, through a process of civilization, so Christian missionaries especially um, went out to attempt to, again, in inverted commas, civilize uh, indigenous populations in the US um, and often failed, although sometimes had some success. Uh, and, and there's, there's whole histories around that as well. Thirdly, removal via treaties. So signing treaties with uh, various groups and peoples uh, and effectively, um, usually through some means of force as well, uh, getting them to relocate to new areas. And you'll have seen that if you've done anything on uh, removal in the 1830s uh, of people like Cherokee, for example, to Oklahoma, you will you will know something about that. And that that's what Jeffrey Osler book, uh, Osler's book is actually about that early process of removal. And finally, a genocidal warfare and an attempted assimilation of uh, those people who could not be uh, completely removed. So by assimilation, we mean kind of bringing them in and, and forcing those peoples to adopt uh, US customs, culture, etc. Uh, and Osler basically argues that the final option was the one that was pursued. So all these options were tried, but the final one was pursued most seriously. And then actually in conversations I've had um, with Leandra as well. Um, we've talked about the, there being almost like a fifth one as well, which is a, an engineered forgetting of those four processes as well. So that's kind of an additional one to this, that if we then think that this process didn't happen or that we, we fail to recognise the continued existence of uh, Indigenous peoples in the United States, the land of the United States today, uh, then that also creates and continues this work here. Um, and I also want to bring in two people at this point, because I think, uh, again, we talked about the idea of genocide and that being a very, very serious term, but it actually being appropriate, um, very much appropriate in this case. Um, and we have lots of evidence from uh, military campaigns against, uh, in this case, the Ocheti Shakaway, uh, in which here we've got uh, William Sherman, who was, of course, one of the, the great heroes of the Civil War period uh, and, and the defeat of the Confederate South, uh, talking 
about acting with vindictive earnestness. So not just earnestness, vindictive earnestness, you know, pointed and deliberate and unpleasant um, against us. He calls them the Sioux here, um, even to their extermination. So literally uh, promoting genocidal policies. And that's not the only time he says that. There's whole uh, stacks of letters between Sherman and Sheridan and a whole range of other um, US Army figures who would also uh, use similar terms uh, and not just Sherman, of course. Uh, and then the second kind of branch of that uh, comes under here. So this is Richard Pratt. Uh, and Pratt was one of the founders of the boarding school movement, uh, which aimed to take uh, indigenous and Native American children out of their families, out of their cultures, out of their um, homes, effectively, put them into boarding school systems for a number of years and convert them to assimilate them into uh, uh, white US society. Uh, and Pratt's mantra in doing this was actually no different really to Sherman's just with, with I was going to say without the violence, but it's not without the violence, it's just with a different sort of violence. He talks about killing the Indian and saving the man. Uh, and the boarding school systems were very much designed to kill off, to destroy um, as far as they could, the vestiges of uh, identity that these children had, of, uh, of their um, identity with their particular tribe or group or nation. So two different approaches, but very much uh, similar in their attempts to remove uh, Native American presence. And I think it's also worth uh, at this point just getting ourselves a brief overview of um, what was happening. So we know, or you will know hopefully a little bit of the background to this, that um, there was uh, increasing um, uh, movements from the 1800s onwards to move out into land uh, beyond the kind of eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, and particularly once we get into the gold rush era, so 1849, the California gold rush uh, creates a, a desire for uh, even more movement westwards across the west coast uh, and the beginnings of a treaty period in which uh, the US government tries to negotiate, first of all, passage and then uh, handovers of land um, from uh, Native American peoples whose uh, lands and areas are disrupted, although interestingly not so much in California where they just went and took those lands anyway. Uh, as we go forwards by the 1860s we're seeing increasing settlement on the plains, particularly post um, the 1859 gold rush. Um, we see that the treaties that were put in place in the 1850s are not upheld and that was a major cause of the Dakota War, um, which you will have come across as Little Crow's War I think in your uh, textbooks if you've studied it and we talked about why that's problematic last time and it led to um, one of the largest mass executions in history um, where 38 Dakota people were hanged on the same day and it still stands as this horrific um, testament to US uh, policy uh, and that was of course sanctioned by Lincoln so again the complexity of some of the figures in this US history is, is interesting uh, and then as we move through the 1860s into the 1870s we see increasing violence against Native American peoples as the US Civil War comes to an end and that violence gets turned westwards, really, especially onto the plains, um, but elsewhere as well. Uh, we have the um, the incursions into Ocheti Shakaway lands uh, where miners uh, start searching for gold in Powder River country. And that leads to the Powder River War with Red Cloud, uh, which again, th this actually ends with a huge victory for the Lakota led by Red Cloud um, and the second Fort Laramie Treaty. And then into the 1870s, we see a much more concerted effort now from the US government to um, fulfill an extermination policy. And that begins with removing uh, food sources, but also sacred uh, sources of sacred um, meaning with the extermination of the buffalo on the plains, especially the ending of treaty making. So from 1871 onwards, the US government refuses to make treaties with Native American peoples. Um, and therefore treats them as non-sovereign, it treats them as, as people who, who kind of exist in the US but don't have any rights of their own. Um, and that leads to all kinds of um, problems further down the line, which we'll get to. And this results in 1876 with the Battle of the Little Bighorn or the Greasy Grass, um, which again results in a huge defeat for the US Army. But in the long term, it results in a massive campaign against uh, the Ochechishakwe and other um, groups as well. They are pursued, chased down, and by 1887, we find that most um, Native American peoples have been moved onto reservations. Um, the boarding school system we just talked about a minute ago has been set up to educate in inverted, inverted commas and assimilate the children um, who've moved onto these reservations. And we see also 
um, two really big changes. One, the outlawing of traditional religions uh, and, and practices, so including things like sun dance ceremonies for the Acheti Shekawi, um, but also uh, basic religious practices that were not allowed. Uh, and the creation of the Doors Act, which basically handed over um, small parcels of land to individual uh, Native American peoples, uh, people, sorry, um, and in return, the surplus land was to be given over to white colonial settlement. Not everybody signed up to that. Many uh, tribes, many groups didn't sign up to that. But millions and millions of acres of reservation lands were given over to settlement um, during uh, that period, 1887 and onwards. And in 1890, I think most people are aware of um, the massacre at Wounded Knee uh, and especially the, the murder of Bigfoot and, and the mini conju um, who he led. So this is kind of where we are in that settler colonial story. And you can see it really clearly, I think, when you frame it there um, in relation to the Ocheta Shakaway in particular. Now, before we move on any further with today's session, I wanted to um, show you something here because um, what we're dealing with today is not just uh, a range of stories and, and um, sort of a disconnected history. This is a history which still has a very live and very meaningful impact on people today. So what I want to do is show you a short video and it comes from a brilliant project called the Wo Lakota Project um, in which Lakota and Dakota elders talk about uh, a whole range of uh, issues and, and, and things. But in this case, we've got Faith Spotted Eagle talking about history, trauma and healing and why all of this is so important. So if you don't mind, I'm going to apologise because the video will probably be a little bit choppy, but I think it's really important we hear what um, Faith Spotted Eagle has to say here. Um, so I'm going to play this just for a few minutes uh, and then we will come back to uh, talk about uh, the, these stories um, uh, uh, that show uh, resistance and survival. I think probably when we talk about these losses and these traumas, it's important since the, the student body that will be watching this is Native and non-Native and other cultures, that when we talk about this, it is not to impart a sense of guilt, it's to impart a sense of freedom from denial. So by, and, and when you look at that trauma response, the Native people's um, objective is to heal the non-native people's objective is to come out of denial. And when these folks can come out of denial and these ones can start to heal, then they can start to come together on common ground. But I think um, probably the there's many layers of trauma. Um, when the original treaties were made, there were two reasons why the treaties were made. One was to make peace, obviously, on the surface. And the second one was for land taking. It was primarily to create agreements to take land. And so that was a main trauma because we didn't have a concept of, oh, this is my 40 acres. It's like I'm hunting in that area. Other relatives come and hunt. And so it wasn't, it, had, it was a different, in the cult cultural cup, it was more like natural law that you didn't hunt in that area when the Blackfeet were there. You didn't hunt in that area when the Shoshone were there were there so you you kind of get, get give and take but um when uh the immigrants started to come in from euro america primarily what began to happen was um there was a sense of um displacement where the hunting areas could no longer be accessed and so that really actually created direct starvation which is a major trauma with indian children or any children and then another um, one that was really difficult, and we're just now reclaiming that, so it's ex we're, we live in an exciting era of reclamation, is that the taking of one's language is actually an act of war, because you're saying you can't speak anymore on the way that you understand the world. So <clears throat> what happened was when, and that didn't even affect our resiliency, when the language was taken, when the ceremonies were outlawed, I do believe that the thing that did the most damage was when thousands of Indian children, native children, were shipped off to boarding schools. And these boarding schools were not just down the road. They were like in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, California, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, all over the country. These little tiny children were put on trains. And at this point in my life, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter, and I can't even picture putting her on a train and sending her to Pens uh, Virginia by herself. I can't even picture that. But they were that was done, and when that happened, 
the children began to come home damaged with trauma. They had been molested. And you can't really tell your grandma about that. You say, you know, grandma, something happened, but you're not going to describe it. So then it gets buried. And that's a trauma. That's another layer. And then when you get to be 20, 16, 25, it's still there. It doesn't go away. So then people begin to sedate themselves. Another layer happens where alcohol and drugs comes in. So there's another layer of trauma. And then when you have um, drugs and alcohol, violence enters the picture. Violence comes into the room. And then there's another layer. It's like, oh, no, I saw an act of violence. And actually, that is something that all of America is dealing with. It's not just Native people, because we do live in a in a lot of violence. And so those are those layers of trauma. And when you have a stack this high and somebody is pushing on you, that stack gets a little bit shaky and you have to be aware of that because, but the important thing is that you can begin to resolve some of those. And it's it behooves us to do that because if we don't do that, we're gonna impart this stack to our children. And they are gonna not only have to carry their own stacks, but they'll have to carry our, our traumas. And Okay, um, I hope that came through okay for everybody. I think it's just important to think about those things as we start um, uh, looking at all of these issues that we're going to That's touch on today. Um, so thinking about this then, we've seen that there is this uh, process of settler colonialism happening to the Ocheti Shakaway. Um, if we want to then think about uh, resistance to settler colonialism and what was happening there, I think we also need to think about the ways in which people could and were able to and tried to resist that settler colonial um, process. So I've divided it into three big areas here. And if you're doing anything on civil rights here for A-level, um, you, you might have come across this uh, as well. So the first uh, area is, or first sort of um, aim of resistance is just survivance. Uh, and survivance is more than survival. So it's, it's a, very deliberate, a, diff a very deliberately different term. Uh, it's about resilience. It's about continuing to live and continuing to um, attempt to thrive despite the odds. Uh, it's about continued existence. So uh, resistance through survival is kind of how I would term it as I put on the left hand side here. Uh, it involves actions which um, ensure that your 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 people, maybe your uh, culture, your identity doesn't die out completely. And actually, we see that not just in what happens to Native American peoples, but also enslaved peoples as well. Um, and, and you may have come across that in that uh, regard as well. So that's one form of resistance. It might also be um, being successful within the system that surrounds you. So being successful within the boarding school system into which you've been assimilated, um, I think, is, is part of that as well, but also not letting go of your your roots, your identity. Um, Second sort of big aim of resistance would be civil rights. So um, once uh, Native American peoples get incorporated into the United States, unwillingly in most cases, um, fighting to have the same rights as US citizens. And again, there are lots of echoes here to what happens to uh, black Americans, but actually looking for equal rights within the colonial United States, civil rights movement is a really big part of some resistance. And we'll see that today as well. But the final one is quite different to what we'll see, I think, with lots of black Americans, because this one is about sovereignty or having control or, you know, regaining control over the affairs of your your people, your nation, your tribe. Um, so having your control of your land, having control of your government, having control of your laws, maybe your economy um, or, or what that or what those things might even look like is a really big part of resistance as well. So. For lots of Native American peoples, and especially the Ocheti Shakaway, one aim of resistance was always to re-establish sovereignty. Now, of course, that's a really difficult thing to do. And of course, um, lots of the, uh, the conflict which occurred um, due to settler colonialism was about maintaining that sovereignty, which was then um, systematically removed through the period from 18, 18, well, the 1870s onwards, really. So those three aims are kind of all in the background. And the one other thing I will say before we get into these stories is that the there is a huge impact of that resistance. Uh, we're going to look at two key stories today of, of um, uh, people of the Acheti Shakaway who, who resisted and survived. Um, but actually through resistance, through survivance, through a fight for civil rights and sovereignty, uh, we see that by 1934, far from having disappeared, Native American nations um, see a step change. There is an end to the policy of selling off 
uh, lands that have been holding tribal trust. Um, there is a priority for Native Americans taking jobs in on reservations, so they're not not agencies are not just staffed by white Americans. Um, we see the removal of some, though not all, prohibitions on dancing and some ceremonies um, that the full removal is not actually till 1970. So it's still a long way off. Um, and there was some limited government uh, established. So the uh, allowing uh, Native American tribes to set up their own tribal governments and therefore begin to have a little bit more control over what happens on reservation lands at any rate, um, if not uh, more broadly. Uh, and again, those reservations being much reduced. But there are some things that have happened and those don't happen by accident. They happen because of the resistance and survival of uh, key people but also the peoples as a whole. So we're going to look at two stories um, in, in doing this. Luther Standing Bear, uh, who you can see on the left hand side here, and Zit Kalashar. And both of them I think give us a really good illustration of what it meant to do all of these things in terms of resistance and survival. So survivance, campaigning for civil rights and thinking about what sovereignty might mean um, post-1890. Uh, and they're both quite interesting because they both span this period. So Luther Standing Bear uh, or Otakite uh, or Plenty Kill, uh, as he was born, uh, is Lakota. He was born, we think, somewhere around 1868, although it's a little bit hazy. Uh, and he is therefore born at the point when the Powder River War is concluding, Red Cloud has just been victorious, and there's this establishment of, of a great reservation area, which the US promised they will not go into. Through his early life, through the first 10 years of his life, he's effectively raised in a very traditional way. And he talks about it in a fantastic book, uh, well, several fantastic books. This is one of them, is Land of the Spotted Eagle, um, but also uh, things like My People the Sioux. Uh, and he's raised in a very traditional way. So that almost that traditional image you might have, uh, this like this Catlin image on the left hand side here of a buffalo hunt, that is a good part of what uh, Luther Standing Bear's early or Otakite's early life is like. Um, as we move on, by the time we get to the 1870s, of course, we are seeing uh, US Army incursions. We're seeing the beginning of uh, miners going into the Black Hills. And in 1875, you can see here a, a delegation of Lakota and Arapaho leaders meeting uh, to discuss how they avoid conflict. Basically, how can the US um, be persuaded to get out of the territory they said they wouldn't go into uh, that was reserved in the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. Um, and that ultimately doesn't succeed. And we end up with the Battle of the Greasy Grass, the Little Bighorn. Um, and although that again was a victory for the Ochetishakwe and their allies, um, it led to the chasing down and the persecution of uh, peoples who were not on reservation and they were forced back onto reservations and then forced onto smaller and smaller reservations. So by the time he is about um, seven, eight years old, Otakite has been um, forced to relocate onto the Rosebud Reservation, which is in South Dakota. And you can see South Dakota here in the red and the Rosebud Reservation here um, by about 1877, 1878. Uh, and one of the things that his father, who is uh, called Standing Bear, uh, does is he uh, is kind of in two minds. He, he obviously raised um, Otakite in a very traditional way, but he also believed that it was necessary for uh, his son to be educated uh, in these boarding schools that were being set up. He thought that was the only possible route of um, progress for his family, possibly his people. Um, and he persuades uh, his son to go and attend the Carlisle boarding school in Pennsylvania, which is all the way over here. I mean, we're talking thousands, well, probably at least a thousand miles away, if not slightly more. Um, so Otakite uh, agrees. He goes off to the boarding school. And there's lots he writes about the experience of that uh, and having his identity removed. And one of the early things he talks about is having to go to this school and choose a new name. Uh, and he talks about actually just having a list of names on a wall and pointing a stick at one of them uh, and uh, alighting on the name Luther. And he takes his father's name as a surname. So he becomes Luther Standing Bear at this point. Uh, and actually very quickly, he is persuaded by some of the arguments of the boarding school uh, that Pratt, Henry Pratt, who we met earlier, killed the Indian, saved the man, um, that, that Pratt has set up. Uh, and he buys in to a certain extent to the idea that education in the white education system is the, the appropriate route forwards. And he writes back uh, lots of letters that you can read, uh, but he writes back to his father talking about this. He says, we had a funeral this evening, father. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into that issue here because it's, it's 
there's so much trauma around people who died at boarding schools and never got to see their homes again. Um, but what's interesting is how he frames this. Um, and he says, you think we felt sorry and cried, walked around and killed horses and gave them away the things which ha that we have. You know, it's not right to do that way if we are truly civilized. You must go with us in the White's Road, dear father. How can we live if we are not civilized? And I always wonder what it must have been like uh, for Standing Bear to receive that particular letter um, and to listen to the way in which his son has kind of been assimilated into a way of thinking um, that what his own people have done and believed for centuries is wrong and problematic. Um, but this is the kind of the effect that the boarding schools are supposed to have. So his early education, so he was about 11 when he goes to boarding school uh, and he's writing this, he's probably in his early teens at this point. And, and really there's this division you can see building between him and his own people. By the time he's about 17, um, he, he's really kind of converted. We don't have earlier pictures of him uh, or not that I can find anyway. Um, but you can see he's really kind of uh, adopted, as was the aim of schools like Carlisle, uh, a, a mode of dress that was more similar to white European at this point um, and kind of taking on those um, those approaches. Now, he successfully graduated. He was seen as a great uh, success of the system. He was in one of the first classes to graduate. He went on to be a, an apprentice in Philadelphia, also in Pennsylvania. And later he goes back to the Rosebud Reservation uh, and becomes a teacher and works on a day school. So not a boarding school, works in a day school, um, educating um, children on the Rosebud Reservation. In 1890, he then moves to Pine Ridge and 1890, hopefully will be ringing a bell because this is just around the same time as the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, and when he goes to Pine Ridge, he is shocked. It's just in the wake of Wounded Knee. And what he finds effectively is that Pine Ridge Reservation is effectively under siege. It's surrounded, and you can see some of the artillery here, Pine Ridge Agency is surrounded by um, armed the army effectively with cannon, with Hotchkiss guns, with um, soldiers being stationed there constantly. Uh, it, it's effectively a, a prisoner camp at this point because of what's happened with the ghost dance movement and then the massacre and the fear of reprisals. The US is literally sending soldiers in to control um, a, an agent, a, a reservation which wasn't violent. Um, so this really changes his outlook. So he's gone through this uh, assimilation process um, and he's survived and been successful in it. But he comes out, comes out to Pine Ridge and his, his viewpoint changes. So he says here uh, in 1928 in My People the Sioux, uh, there I was doing my best to teach my people to follow the white man's road, but the very people I was following had no respect for motherhood of old age or babyhood. Where was all their civilized training? And we see this as a real turning point uh, for standing, uh, Luther Standing Bear. Um, and he looks around at the state, and this is Pine Ridge Reservation, somewhere around 1890. He looks around at the broken promises about what reservation life was supposed to give to uh, the Ocheti Shakawi and failed to do. Uh, and he looks around and he must have seen uh, and he must have encountered the survivors of Wounded Knee. Uh, and this is a photograph entitled uh, The Last Remaining People at Wounded Knee. And you can see from Wounded Knee here. Uh, and you can see here children and babies and uh, just the horrific uh, experience of encountering what it must have been like uh, for the soldiers to have surrounded this group and murdered them. So Luther Standing Bear is kind of conflicted. He kind of believes in the education system, but he also has no longer believes in the mission. Um, and Ultimately, he spends some time working on Pine Ridge Reservation. He tries to set up a post office, but is refused um, because he's not allowed to be a postmaster because he's not white. Um, and ultimately, he gets frustrated with the whole thing. He goes off and joins a traveling Wild West show called Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. So he actually came to Britain, uh, we know, somewhere in 1902. That doesn't last very long. There's an accident. He has to give it up. Um, goes back to Pine Ridge for a while, gets chosen as a chief, um, but then leaves Pine Ridge in 1906 and he ends up ultimately in Hollywood and he ends up acting in movies. So he kind of goes back to this um, uh, means of surviving within a dominant culture, um, but he doesn't give up there. So one of his big campaigns is about representation for Native American actors, uh, and predominantly actors at this point, but actresses as well, I presume. Um, and he founds a number of institutions. Uh, he founds the War Paint Club in 1926 uh, and the Indian Actors Association in 1936, uh, basically in an attempt to get rights and recognition and appropriate pay and um, you know safety for um, Native Americans who were playing roles in Hollywood films at the time. So he's directly trying to seek civil rights for um, 
his own people, but also other Native Americans as well. Um, and he also, in this period, begins some work on cultural preservation, so more survivance, I suppose. Uh, between 1928 and 1934, he turns his mind as a, as a much older man um, to preserving and maintaining Lakota culture and Lakota history. Uh, and he, you can see the shift in his thinking by the time we get here. Uh, he talks in this book here about uh, if I today had a young mind to direct to start on the journey of life and I was faced with the duty of choosing between the natural way of my forefathers and that of the present way of civilization, as he calls it, I would for its welfare and hesitatingly set that child's feet in the path of my forefathers. I would raise him to be an Indian. So we can see how over his lifetime he's shifting more and more towards this idea that um, what has happened uh, has been this enormous tragedy that needs reversing. And his work between 28 and 34, especially in these books uh, and his advocacy work, contributes really significantly to um, the, the Indian New Deal, which we talked about earlier, the Indian Reorganisation Act of 1934, which brings about some of these changes on reservations. So he is, uh, although he doesn't necessarily campaign for full sovereignty, he's certainly moving towards that line of saying uh, there needs to be a better deal for Native American peoples and we need to undo some of the damage that's been done through what's happened. So I think Luther Standing Bear is a really interesting case in point to look at that. The other person I wanted to flag at this uh, juncture is uh, Zit Kalashar. Uh, Zit Kalashar is Dakota uh, and she is born, she's actually born Gertrude Simmons and she changes her name later in life to Zit Kalashar, uh, which means red bird. Uh, and it's a very deliberate choice to preserve again culture. She's uh, unlike Luther Standing Bear, she's born on a reservation. So uh, in 1876, just in the aftermath of um, the Little Bighorn, the Greasy Grass. Um, and she lives on the Yankton Reservation, uh, which again is in South Dakota, and you can see it in red here, and you can see the Yankton Reservation um, here. Um, now, Zit Kalashar was, um, we don't know a lot about her early life, except what she writes about it. Uh, and she writes some lovely books, which I'll talk about later, where you can learn, and I think I actually to read a little bit of it. Um, but she talks a lot about her um, experiences of growing up. So, uh, she was at the age of eight recruited by Christian missionaries um, to go to a boarding school in Indiana. So again, hundreds of miles away from her home. Uh, and at the age of eight, she is actually relatively happy to go, which I think is a phenomenal um, bravery, actually, from an eight year old girl. I'm trying to think about, um, you know, my niece or, or my, my daughter's four now, but I can't imagine at the age of eight she'd be happy to go away um, and live on a, on, on, in, a, in a school hundreds and hundreds of miles away from her home and, and family. Um, but she wants to go, she wants to learn, and she sees this as a positive step. Her family are actually much more against it than she is initially. Um, and Zit Kalashar, much like Luther Standing Bear, um, finds that the experience of going to boarding school uh, very different from her expectations. Uh, it's both um, it gives her opportunities and she says she talks in her own words and her own works about uh, loving learning and loving learning languages especially and loving writing and loving music and she's a very talented uh, violinist and musician we'll come on to that a little bit later but also even from a very young age she's aware of the violence and she's aware of the um the assimilation processes that that these schools are trying to put in place um and she talks here uh, in one of her books um, ab about what happens when she first goes to boarding school. And it's a story about having her hair cut. Um, and I'm just going to read it because I think it's a powerful story. And if you want to read the whole thing, please do go and, and look it up. Uh, she says, when no one noticed, I disappeared. I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could in my squeaking shoes. My moccasins had been exchanged for shoes. On my hands and knees, I crawled under the bed and cuddled myself in a dark corner. From my hiding place, I peered out. Women and girls entered the room. I held my breath and watched them open closet doors and peep behind large trunks. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast to a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit in my anguish. I moaned for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. Now was only one of many little animals driven by the herder. And I think that's such a powerful story because this is something that's happening to an eight year old girl. 
And I think it's we need to remember that all the time. This is something and the trauma of this, as Faith Spotted Eagle talked about it, the trauma of this lives with her right through her life of being forcibly um, having her culture uh, forcibly and visibly removed from her um, and being subjugated and forced to uh, accept the way things were going to be at this boarding school and one of the big things that's come out of the the scandal in Canada recently with the Kamloops boarding school has been um, people denying um, the existence and saying things like you know well if, if these boarding schools were so bad um, why are all these children smiling and you just have to look even a very surface scratch at any of the evidence on the boarding schools will suggest that children will do what they need to do to survive but equally they will be traumatized by the things that are happening um, all the time in these systems so she goes through this boarding school system but despite all of this she still survives and she thrives um, within that system she learns and she learns exceptionally well she learns um, violin she becomes a very very talented musician and um, she graduates and goes back to the reservation briefly but even then in 1891 she wants to go back to school again and she she goes to teacher training college her family don't want her to go, but she goes anyway. Um, and ultimately, and interestingly, she ends up working at the Carlisle Boarding School, which we just talked about where Luther Standing Bear went. Uh, and she works there for two years between 1899 and 1901. Um, and initially, uh, she's sent to go to reservations and recruit children. And the recruitment of children in this era was done in a number of ways. Sometimes children went voluntarily, like Zit Kalashar did. Sometimes children were persuaded to go by their parents. Sometimes children went because if they didn't, there was a threat of removal of rations or violence um, or there was an implication that bad things would happen. Um, and all of those methods were used to get children to schools. And, and what Zit Kalashar finds as she spends more time at this school as a teacher is that she increasingly disagrees with what Pratt is doing. Uh, with these boarding schools and this boarding school in particular and the whole system of boarding schools and she increasingly worries that this that she's part of the problem and again i think bravery is something that goes right through zit kalashar's life and you see it in, in all these things brave in going away brave in resisting having her hair cut brave in writing about her experiences um and then brave in disobeying pratt and ultimately um there is a disagreement about what happens to her um, some people say she's sacked some people say she leaves but she she parts ways with pratt and the boarding school system she goes back home and when she goes back home to um, the Yankton Reservation, she's utterly horrified at what she finds at the, the loss of culture, the loss of cultural knowledge, the stories that have been erased, these children that no longer learn their history, that, that maybe aren't learning their language. Um, and she begins in 1901 gathering up as a, an act of resistance a book of stories called Old Indian Legends, which she publishes in 1901. Um, and one of the things you can see here, this is the Yankton Reservation, it's one of the few pictures from this period. Uh, and you can see this huge, uh, it's called a cathedral, uh, but this huge board church cathedral that's built on the Yankton Reservation. And she looks at that and this gleaming white building that's bringing Christian um, mission into the Yankton Reservation. And she looks at the poverty of the people around it and the loss of their culture. And she, I, she, I read into this from what she says, but she's outraged by what's happening here. So she doesn't just write this book. She also writes about her experiences in magazines. So part of her education has allowed her to move in societies that get her published in New York magazines, for example. And she's really critical of this assimilation policy. And she's especially cr critical of the way in which reservations are run uh, and in which uh, reservations are run down and, and Native American peoples are um, damaged through their experiences, not being given enough rations, not being given opportunities to succeed, um, being kept in poverty having their their ability to even worship and, and have their identity and dance taken away from them. Uh, and later she publishes a book called American Indian Stories in which she tells her um, actual autobiography as well. And that, if you go and search that online, you can usually read that for free because it's out of copyright, um, but you can buy it as a book as well. And I'd really recommend you buy a copy. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so what does she do thereafter? Well, her life really from 1901 onwards is a life of activism. Um, she works in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, so she is part of the management of reservations uh, and she works on a number and she's really critical from within of how they are managed, especially by white management systems. Um, she founds the Society of American Indians in 1911, which lobbies for um, Native Americans to have full citizenship rights, i.e. the right to vote, because at the moment um, from 
1871 onwards, Native Americans are not seen by the US as sovereign peoples and sovereign nations, but equally they're not seen as citizens. So they exist in this weird middle ground where they are nothing according to the US state at any rate. Um, and therefore they don't have rights to vote, they don't have rights. And, and of course the US um, occupies the lands they live on. So they have no say in how those countries are run. So she lobbied for citizenship to to give people an opportunity to vote and, and voice opinions in the US system. But she wanted that to be an optional thing, i.e. people could choose if they wanted to be US citizens or tribal members. Uh, she thought that was a choice people should be able to make. It, that's eventually brought in in 1924, um, but it's forced upon uh, Native American people. So Native Americans become citizens by default in 1924, though access to voting is not straightforward um, as, it, as it wasn't straightforward for black people in the same um, uh, black Americans in the same era. She also takes a number of other actions. So this one is about civil rights. Um, she, in 1913, writes an opera called the Sundance Opera, which is a critical success. Uh, she tours it around the country. Um, and I think it's a really brave thing again, because the opera is based on um, taking the Sundance ceremony um, that's so central to the Ocheti Shakaway, and um, she turns that into a form which she thinks white um, Americans will understand, i.e. the opera format. Now, this is at a point when it's illegal to perform a Sundance. So the fact she does this is, is just like a massive smack in the face to the US um, government policy, the US legal system of saying, look, OK, you're not going to allow us to do this in our own way, but I can bring it to you in a new format and then I, I will bring our uh, Sundance, uh, Sundance ceremony to you in this new format. And I think that is just such a, an amazing thing to have done. So this is not just surviving, as we said before, this is survivance because it's pushing back. It's pushing back against the boundaries. Um, another big change for, for Zikula Shah comes as we hit the First World War. And, and those of you who know a little bit about the history might know about Woodrow Wilson and post First World War, the US looking to um, he produces these 14 points to make peace in, in Europe. And one of his points is about self-determination of uh, imperial um, conquests, i.e. That, that European empire should be dis dismantled and, and the countries they've conquered be allowed to do their own thing. And she says, well, hang on, if he believes that, what about Native American peoples in the US? And so post First World War, she becomes increasingly left wing in her politics. Um, and she goes on to found the Council of uh, American Indians, um, which has a, a number of other notable members, uh, and they push for um, investigations into uh, the management of reservations, but also um, starting to push for ideas around self-determination, self-government for Native American peoples as well, or the return of self-government, I should say. Uh, and that leads to uh, something called the Merriam Report in 1928, which is basically the first proper US investigation into the conditions on reservations. And it finds that the, the conditions are horrendous. Um, so the average income in 1920s America was about $1,300. Um, on, a, on reservations, the average income was about $100. So it really highlights the, the disparities in US society and, and um, particularly for Native American peoples who by 1928 are citizens. Um, and so she lobbies for civil rights and improvements of conditions on reservations and voting rights right the way through to her death. Um, and again, is significant in leading to uh, the creation of the Indian New Deal in 1934, but also towards the end of her life, she is pushing for um, and, and uh, promoting a narrative which is about return of sovereignty to Native American peoples. And so she almost goes that step further, I think, than Luther Standing Bear. And this is one of the you know, final pieces of work she publishes. She talks about here, the Ocheta Shakaway were subdued by starvation and forced to surrender their lands, filled with the stench of putrefying carcasses of buffalo herds, to talk about extermination, wantonly killed by paid sharpshooters. This is the outcome of the white man's broken promises to the Sioux weeping over the cold, lifeless bodies in their weak arms, their little darlings dead from hunger and fever. And she becomes this incredibly powerful advocate for change. Uh, and we see some of that in what happens in the New Deal, but her dream actually isn't fully fulfilled by the time of her death. And I think one of the saddest things actually, for me about Zit uh, and um, her life is that at the end of her life, uh, her memorial actually ends up just getting attached to her husband. So she ends up going down as the wife of um, uh, her husband rather than having her own memorial. So actually in her own time, she's, her left wing politics almost pushed her to the edge and she's almost been resurrected by a later generation of um, people looking back and saying, this is what a fantastic model uh, this woman was for resistance, for campaigning for civil rights, but also campaigning for Native American sovereignty.
Now, um, I'm afraid we haven't managed to get Leandro back, uh, unfortunately. So I'm just blaming this on teams and the way it's gone. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly. Uh, well, Leandro was going to do this bit um, uh, as well. But uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the fact that um, survivance and resistance weren't just about the Ocheta Shekwe. So we've talked about them in particular. But of course, uh, this was something much, much wider. And of course, it's worth saying it wasn't just um, key people like uh, Luther Standing Bear and um, Zit Kalashar. Survivance and resistance uh, happened in everyday life for every single Native American person who was, uh, you know, on a reservation or, or under the control of the US government. Uh, all the everyday actions of continuing to hold on to stories, even if in secret, continuing to speak the language, even if it's done in secret, continuing to survive and have children and thrive and enjoy. All of those things are acts of resistance and survivance. And I think it's really important to say that because it's not just about, you know, the heroic figures, although they do make good lenses to look at this thing. People are doing this all the time and in every possible way. And, and again, Faith Spotted Eagle talked about that a little at the beginning, I think. So uh, let's take this a little bit wider. Susan LaFleche uh, Picot or Susan LaFleche um, is Omaha. Um, and some of you may know her from, from the, one of the textbooks, my textbook, and I think some of the others do as well. Um, she gives us another example of how it's not just happening in one place and to the Lakota and Dakota, it's happening to other Indian nations as well, Native American nations as well. Um, so Susan Lafesh uh, was, was a political and social reformer. Um, she is the first Native American to become a doctor, a physician. Um, and she doesn't just become a doctor and a physician. She graduates magna cum laude. She graduates first in her class. She does it uh, fantastically. Um, and she is, as Leandra's talked about here, a warrior woman for the Omaha people. Um, and I know Leandra has got a piece that she's written recently about this. It's coming out at some point in August. So I will direct you to that as soon as it comes out. Um, and it's just a shame she can't talk to you more about this here. So I will do my, my slightly uh, shorter version of what she was going to talk about. Um, but you can see uh, Susan Lafesh here in her graduating class in 1889 um, from her medical school. Um, and she goes on to um, both survive and resist through provision of um, medical um, uh, support for her people. Um, she's really driven. Uh, the, the story of her becoming a physician comes out of uh, a story where she is trying to look after an old person who's become very sick on her reservation um, and she sends for a doctor and the story goes that the doctor, it takes hours to get hold of a doctor and when the doctor hears that he needs to come out in, in the night or a storm, I can't remember which is, but it's one of those, um, to visit a, an elderly um, Omaha person, he basically says, well, I'm not going to bother. It's just another Indian. It's the phrase that, that this doctor allegedly um, goes through. So this kind of drives her into saying, well, if they're not going to look after it, then I will I will take up that mantle. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to leave this one for here and maybe we can get Leandra to talk a little bit about this uh, payout, um meeting um, uh, when after this session. Um, but I will go on to talk about Susan uh, LaFleche having this really difficult um, double existence she had to navigate. So she was both. Uh, this doctor and and sort of active in um, what we might term you know 19th century late Victorian in in the UK um, society and she was all of those things but equally she had to navigate that and uh, what it meant to also be Omaha at the same time and she she always I think felt torn between those two sides of things uh, and and not everybody supported her decision to go on and and train in the medical school and all of those things so the, there was there is a trauma as well for people who do go off into these. Uh, schools and, and train and learn to um, uh, survive within the US system, that they're not always then accepted by um, their own people. And I think that is a real trauma that, that Susan carried through her life. Um, but one of the things I think is really interesting, really important about what uh, Susan LaFleche did is she doesn't just set up um, medical um, facilities uh, for her uh, people and on the reservation, she sets up uh, medical facilities that are targeted at helping mothers as well. So there's a big maternity ward uh, in the hospital, which you can see down at the bottom here, um, and you can still see the building, it's still there. Uh, the hospital she sets up has a big maternity ward. And so actually in a, in a huge way, she's contributing not just to the health of people and therefore their survival, but also the continued existence of the people by ensuring that uh, children who are born aren't uh, 
succumbing to disease as you know lots of children died very young and in this period anyway but the conditions on many reservations made that even worse uh, and, and infant mortality was exceptionally high so by providing um, maternity care Susan the Flesh is, is very directly involved in helping her people to survive and of course um, like I say we will we'll get the to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on so hopefully this gives you some sense uh, that 1890 very much was not the end of a story. 1890 isn't even uh, the beginning of a story of resistance. 1890 sits and Wounded Knee sits in the middle of an already existing story of resistance and survival in relation to US settler colonialism. And I think some of these stories help us understand how significant it was and how important it was that um, uh, that we un that it is sorry that we understand that Native American peoples didn't disappear in 1890 and they weren't subdued completely in 1890 but that doesn't mean the US was not trying to do that in 1890 and beyond um, so their continued existence I think is really important and of course we know that as I talked about at the beginning we get the Reorganization Act of 1934 which takes away some of these um, really problematic policies of allotment of um, prohibitions on set certain ceremonies uh, and remove complete removal of the authority of tribal governments and we get some of those things reversed but it's also worth saying that uh, that's not the end of the story either so you know this is a great story of resistance but also settler colonialism is exceptionally powerful and that didn't end the story um, Collier, when uh, Collier was involved in the, the creation of the Indian Reorganisation Act under the um, Franklin D. Roosevelt government, uh, and when he draws up um, a blueprint for what these governments will look like on reservations, he bases it largely on his experience of working with the Pueblos on the Mexican border. Um, and those were really different, for example, to the systems of governance in the Ocheti Shakaway, which were much more um, diverse. So they tended to be more centralised in the Pueblos, they tended to be a little bit more disparate um, and diverse in the Ocheti Shakaway uh, tradition and other um, indigenous traditions as well. So there is a problem that it's almost forcing a single model, a US version of government onto these tribal nations. And actually we know that some of that led to some really significant corruption in some of those governments because of the way they were established um, and who was allowed to establish them as well. Um, Kurt Zitkula especially was very critical of the Indian Reorganisation Act. She thought it didn't go far enough to dealing with the problems that have been set up and she continued to criticise that all her life. Um, and it's also fair to say that that didn't last very long. Um, in the wake of the Second World War, as, as the US goes around the world trying to stamp out communism, um, it was not just keen to uh, remove communism, but it was keen to remove any examples or, or vestiges of what looked like left wing philosophies or communism at home. And Native American reservations where tribes held land together looked too much for lots of US um, policymakers at this point, like socialism, communism. Um, and so there is a continuing effort in the 1940s and 1950s, especially um, to remove uh, the last vestiges of Native American presence. So even though we get this Reorganization Act, there's a strong reaction against it in, in certain parts of the US government. Um, and there is this aim to transfer reservation management away again from tribal governments that have only just been set up and to just basically disband tribes and nations and, and make uh, Native Americans US citizens and have done with it. And so there's a policy pursued between 1953 and about 1968 um, which is called termination, during which 109 tribes are terminated, i.e. their tribal status is removed. 2.5 million acres are handed over to states um, to deal with, uh, and lots of Native Americans are pushed to leave reservations and traditional lands and move into cities. Uh, and we can see an advert for that on the right hand side here, which is why we end up with these huge populations of Native Americans in cities today. And this is kind of the final push towards full assimilation. So. I didn't want to leave the story on too positive a note, I have to say, because there is a reason we still have continuing issues. It doesn't finish with the Indian New Deal in 1934. Um, there is a continuing story of forced assimilation that, that happens afterwards. And what we will do next time, hopefully with Leandra back with us, um, is that we're going to look at how those pasts continue. So we're going to take that story forward again and we're going to be looking at the continuing legacy of settler colonialism in the United States. And we're going to use as a lens for that the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So Leandra will be talking about that quite extensively. Uh, and hopefully you can come and join us for that on the 30th of June. Same time again, 3.30 to 4.30 with catch ups on YouTube afterwards. Uh, there is a little bit of pre-reading for that if you'd like to do it in the packs. And there is some follow up stuff you might like to do on the back of this session as well in those packs too. As ever, if you've got any questions or you'd like to ask anything, please do feel free to chuck it into the uh, Q&A sessions um, or send it through via your teachers.
Um, but other than that, I look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>